Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashrothi, the voice of New Eden, and this is December 13th, YC 124. The Yule season is getting cold, but the war zone is hot. Let's go ahead and check it out on the Eve Universe show. Let's talk about faction warfare. Uh, there's been a lot of people talking to me about this, a lot of people asking questions. I've been doing faction warfare for quite some time. And so I, I wanted to give some time to digest some of the details about it. I kind of have. Um, and it's time for me to start talking to you guys about how Faction Warfare works, why you should get involved, what it really is, et cetera, et cetera, and how to be successful at it. So uh, to begin with, I am currently in the system of Fleet in the Federal Defense Union. In order to join Faction Warfare, you must do so one of two ways. You can either... Join any corporation or alliance that is inside of Faction Warfare. If you're watching this sometime next year after the uh, Allegiance system has been put in, this requirement may have changed. But as of the time of this recording, uh, in December of YC 124 to 2022, right now you have to be in either a player corporation or alliance within Faction Warfare or within the Militia Corporation within Faction Warfare. So... If you are joining a player group, then all you have to do is join the player group just like normal. Although you must understand that once you join Faction Warfare, you will be hunted down uh, and, and, and considered an enemy by the NPCs within the enemy-aligned Faction high-sec space. So if you're joining Galente Faction Warfare for some reason, uh, you and you do so while you're still in Jita, you're going to have like a death run to get out. So make sure to move to the location or whatever that you want to end up in when you're in Faction Warfare before you join the Faction Warfare Corp. If you are joining a Faction Warfare Group, uh, the NPC Corp, then you're going to need to dock up in a faction or in a station that is owned by the faction that is in Faction Warfare. Um, so, for instance, you would need to join a, a job in a Glente station. I don't think you actually need a strictly speaking Federal Defense Union station to do it, but um, yeah. Either way, there are actually two different windows that are available to you to give you information about the faction about faction warfare. Within the agency, under encounters, we have the faction warfare section, which gives us information about the uh, the way that faction warfare works, how to enlist, all this stuff, and lets us look at the faction warfare systems that are available. You can use this from anywhere while on any team. So you can look at any system and see what plexes are available, its contested syst uh, s status, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, all from the comfort of your station with different settings, just like anything else within the agency. However, there is a new window, which is this one. This one allows us to visually see the war zone much more clearly. Now, this is basically the point of faction warfare. Effectively, in uh, 2008, in YC 1110, um, sorry, in YC 110, uh, the factions began, the empires began to descend into war during the events of what's now known as the Empyrean Age and the Empyrean Age books. Uh, the short of it is, is that it was decided by the empires that rather than fight the war themselves, they would agree to fight for the contested territories via proxy war by the various, um, by, and by players, right? So this is why faction warfare is the way it is. We are um, effectively privateers paid for by the empires to control the territory between their different, uh, between the empire space. So uh, the Caldari Galente war zone has a little bit over one and a half times as many systems as the Amar Mimitar war zone does. It used to be twice, but uh, Celis Agard, the bull cut butcher, managed to take a bunch of systems for the Galente permanently, taking them off of the war zone. So as you can see, uh, the Amar Mimitar war zone is still smaller as far as systems go, but not as it was as much as it was before. Now, uh, system ownership is controlled by player activity, and there are three different kinds of systems. If a system is adjacent to a, if a system that is controlled by your team is uh, adjacent to a system controlled by the enemy team, then both systems are known as frontline systems. 
So any system that is adjacent to an enemy system is considered a front line. This also means that if, for instance, um, uh, one of these systems, like, um, uh, let's say, let's say this system right here, Ikoskio. Uh, if Ikoskio was to be taken by the Galente Federation, if this entire area was taken by the Galente Federation, this system would continue to be a frontline system because this Samanuni system, even though it is a high sec system, is a Kaldari system, which means Ikoskio can only ever be either Kaldari controlled or a frontline system. Likewise, if you come down here to the system of Old Man Star, Old Man Star is adjacent to Valor, which is a high sex system. Therefore, even if this entire area was taken by the, by the state, Old Man Star would always be at least a front line, okay? So there are some systems that will never be a, a, something other than a front line. Now, if a system is adjacent to a front line, but not adjacent to an enemy system. So like this, like Tama right here, like Suge is a front line and Nisu are both front lines. Tama is not adjacent to Anato, Oin, or Naga, but it is adjacent to Nisoa and Sugerento. Therefore, it is what's called a command out, uh, operations um, system. So if you're adjacent to a front line, one of your own front lines, but not an enemy system, then it is a command outpost. And if a system is more than two jumps or two jumps or more away from the nearest front line, then it is what is known as a rear guard. Now, each of these types of systems have a different effect. For example, in a front line system, both sides of the war can dock in any stations, okay? Uh, in any of the NPC stations. However, in a uh, command operations or a rear guard, only the owning system, uh, the owners of the system, the owning forces of the system, I should say, can dock in those stations. So if I went to uh, Nisua, for example, I would be able to dock in any stations that happened to be there. But if I went to Kadama, I would not be able to, okay, as a, as a Galente guy. Likewise, uh, as we're, as they're fighting over Oinosaikin, they could dock in Oinosaikin, but Assuming that there are stations in a boon, which there are not, uh, then they would be able to. Then they would not be able to dock in a boon. They cannot dock in Fliet. They can't dock in Devon. They can't dock in any of these places down here, unless they are part of the Glente faction warfare or a neutral. Okay. Now, certain sites only appear in certain areas, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the different kinds of sites. But to suffice it to say, the uh, the combat plexes that we fight over appears everywhere. Um, but the data sites that are used to hack to get the propaganda site, uh, towers and the listening posts can only be found, excuse me, in the enemy rear guard system. So if I wanted to get, excuse me, if I wanted to get the pieces to put up Galente propaganda towers and Galente observation posts in order to help the Galente with their advantage, then I would need to go to Caldari rear guard systems and hunt for Kaldari operation centers and hack their cans for Kaldari information splices and decoders in order to transform them into those, uh, those tools. Um, and in fact, we can go to the loyalty point store here and see that in action. We have the Glente listening posts that are looking for decoder packages, and we've got the propaganda towers that are looking for the encoder slices, splices, okay? The reason why these are important is because each system has a second stat beyond just the uh, uh, the contested value, right? So Nisawa here. Nisawa is currently 22% contested. Uh, nope, that's not true. The Nisawa is now, right now 42% contested. My bad, 42.9% contested. However, it has 22% advantage to the Kaldari. These are two separate stats, okay? So the Kaldari have done 2% of objectives, but they have so many neighboring systems that they get a bunch of advantage just from that, right? So Nisua, they own Tama, they own Kadama, they own Hiri, they own Natoras, 
And so all of these adjacent systems are pumping advantage into Nisua for them. So they just have like a basically by default a 22% net advantage um, because the Glente only get a 10% and uh, the Kaldari get a 30% plus the 2% of the advantages of the objectives that they've been doing. Um, if we go to, you know, Nenamelia, we see that the Kaldari have 40% from neighboring systems and the Galente have 10% from neighboring systems, but an, adjacent, an additional 21% from completing objectives, okay? Likewise, in Oix, we have big difference, right? 76% contested, so it's owned by the Galente, but the Kaldari are within 14% of being able to to take this system, okay? If this gets to 100% contested, then that system becomes vulnerable and they can attack the iHub within that system. If the iHub gets to 99% hull, it shuts down completely and flips over to the enemy side. It used to take downtime, but from my understanding, it happens immediately now. So, um, so this system is under great risk, okay? Meanwhile, the Kaldari have put up 90% of the objectives. So they have 100% contested value right now because they're getting 10% from their neighboring system of EHA and they're gaining 90% from completed objectives. Meanwhile, the Galente have 10% from a neighboring systems from this Valor bonus right here, uh, but 78% from completed objectives, which means that even though the Kaldari have done 90%, pushed it up by their objectives, they only have a net difference of a 12% advantage. So at this point, the only way for Kaldari to increase their advantage within Oix would be to disrupt the Galente advantage, which brings us back to these things here. The Galente propaganda broadcast and the Galente listening po posts. The propaganda broadcast tower, when placed within a system, after it, basically both of these things are effectively miniature rogue drone sites. So you drop this thing like rogue drone crab beacons. So you attack this, you drop this thing, and rats start to attack you. They want to destroy it, and after some time, I don't remember the exact timer. I think it's like thirty minutes. Um, the site completes, and it gives you points for your side. If you do a propaganda broadcast tower, it increases the um the advantage of your side and if you do a uh, an observation or yeah an observation post a listening post then it reduces advantage for the enemy side okay so to bring this all together if you're in oix right right now the galente could gain advantage by either running more propaganda towers or running listening posts to reduce the uh kaldari um uh advantage however the kaldari cannot run additional propaganda towers right now because they've maxed out their advantage from that the only way for the kaldari to gain additional um advantage within oix is to disrupt the galente um uh, advantage by either running these listening outposts within the system or hunting down the supply caches within those systems. Ah, see, there are different, there are more than one different kinds of site. So within these command, uh, within the, uh, within the, um, the front lines and the command outposts, we see the spawning of supply depots, supply caches, and rendezvous points, all right? Rendezvous points, uh, when you defeat a rendezvous point, there are several waves of rats that come out, and then a final boss. Killing the final boss will increase the advantage for your team within that site. These must be scanned down. Meanwhile, the other one, on the other side, supply caches and supply depots effectively function as quanta of advantage. So if you can hunt down and destroy your opponent's supply depots and supply caches, you will reduce the enemy's advantage. So right now, for instance, in Oix, it would be a good idea for there to be com or probers in Oix and in Vlil hunting for supply uh, Galente supply depots and supply caches in order to destroy them to lower Galente advantage. 
running the Galente rendezvous points would do nothing for them because they already are maxed out their advantage. However, Galente running Kaldari rendezvous points would be advantageous to them because then it would increase their own advantage. Meanwhile, they can also run the supply caches and supply depots. Really, it would be the... Um, the supply uh, caches because the Galente are considered the or the Caldari are considered the attackers here to reduce their advantage. Why do we want to do all this? Well, when a site is completed, when a normal plex combat plex uh, is completed, your side gains a certain number of victory points, which pushes the system further towards your side of the contested. So if you're attacking, it pushes it towards 100%, uh, which is vulnerable. And if you're defending, it pushes it down to 0% or stable. Uh, now, the advantage system provides a, basically a modifier that controls how much victory points you gain for the same action, all right? So if a Galente, or like right now in, let's find a, a more obvious one. So right now in Evalon, it's a 33% advantage to the Galente. So if a Galente and a Caldari were completing the exact same sites, beat for beat, the Galente would pull ahead because the Galente will get more per site completed than the Caldari are. That's what the advantage system does. Not as individual. Oh, it's 10 minutes for the sites. Thank you. Plus the pauses for rats. Uh, that's right. It's basically a novice complex. Um, so what, what this is saying is, is that you as an individual do not necessarily get more rewarded. You don't get more loyalty points for completing the sites with more advantage. But you do, compl you do make more progression in the war zone, okay, uh, for for war zone control. Now, in addition, in addition to propaganda towers, listening outposts, supply depots, supply caches, rendezvous points, and operation centers, which we've all talked about, there is also battlefields. Battlefields are these immense, ba you know, battle sites that appear every three hours and will only appear within frontline systems. They alternate between Caldari and uh, you know one side versus the other, so it'll go. You know, a Caldari one in a Caldari held system, then a Galente one in a Galente held system. Um, the battlefields have are in these massive, like 150 kilometer wide zones, maybe even bigger than that, with three control points and a landing point. Uh, you're basically each of those three control points are basically like a mini plex where you want to defeat all of the enemies within that area and then hold it with your own dudes for long enough. And when all three of them are completed, then the site is completed. Uh, they can take some time. There has been some concerns about seagulling and other people like coming in and just getting the rewards without necessarily doing anything. Recently, this led to CCP nerfing the value of these sites, but there's still a lot of discussion about the rewards for these things and whatnot. So I'm not going to go into too many details of the exact details about these rewards because they're kind of in flux. But just realize that the battlefields do still provide a very significant loyalty point bonus for the people that participate, as well as a victory point and advantage bonus for the side that wins. So battlefields are incredibly important to go after. And uh, they... Uh, like I said, they occur every 30 minutes and they, they are the kind of things that people organize fleets to go deal with, which is one of the reasons why I'm kind of glad that they slow down the pacing of it. Because if you think about it, what they really were asking was in order to properly deal with uh, the war zone, we would have to have a fleet go and do these things every two hours without fail round the clock every day for all of eternity. Now it's every three hours. It was every two hours. So a little bit of a reprieve. It's not the end of the world if you don't if you don't catch every single one of them. And it's now every three hours instead of every two hours. But with it being every two hours and it being as significant of a change as it was, it basically was essential to be uh, to be ready every single one. And remember, this is one of the big things that people don't get about faction warfare, especially if you've been in Nullsec. 
in null sec and in high sec, you have the protections of your time zones, right? People can't attack you when you tell them that they can't. Sure, null sec has a bigger window of opportunity than, say, high sec when it comes to when your structures and system can be attacked. But it's still, you get to choose when you want to defend your system. And outside of that world, you don't have to. In faction warfare, it is round the clock. If you do not have time zone coverage, you don't have anything. So, you know, in that way, uh, faction warfare becomes even more hardcore than null sex stuff, but it's also performed by a much more loose conglomeration of militiamen. So it is different, but if you actually care about the war zone control, that is a huge consideration. And so, like, I remember, us t uh, like, I was talking to the people back when war zones, when battlefields were first coming up, and I was like, how are we going to be able to deal with this every two hours? Like, how, how are we going to run across the whole battlefield? What if there's a front line over on the east side, and then there's a battlefield out on the west side? Like, what are we going to do? And people were like, well, we can just bridge them there. And I was like, are your bridge titans going to be available every fucking two hours for anyone who wants to come? No. No, they're not. So, like, this is a real big puzzle. And one that, like, the militias will continually have to deal with and reinvent solutions to. So, uh, you know, this is this is kind of a big piece of what EVE Online is about, is, like, solving these kind of big problems. Either way. Here we go. So, we've talked a lot about the war zone control. We've talked a lot about the big picture. Let's talk a little bit about why we want to do it, all right? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to join Faction Warfare? More importantly, what will you get out of Faction Warfare by doing it? Well, unlike a lot of other game styles, we don't get just raw isk thrown at us very often. There are Faction Warfare missions, but uh, I would actually recommend against those for the most part. Some people like to say that Faction Warfare will ruin your standings. Being part of regular Faction Warfare will not ruin your standings. Just running plexes and doing war zones and stuff like that will not ruin your standings. Missions will ruin your standings. So keep that in mind. That being said, the main reward is loyalty points. You will get loyalty points for running any Faction Warfare complex in... Uh, in a command outpost or in a front line. And front lines are worth 50% more loyalty points than uh, command center or command outposts are. So if you run a uh, if you run a plex in a, a novice plex in a command outpost, then you will get um, you know 10k LP. If you run it in a front line for the exact same site, you'll get 15k LP. Okay. Uh, now, there are two different kinds of sites, which we'll look at. One of them splits the reward among everyone who's inside, and the other one uh, gets a minimum, or sorry, maximum amount of reward for per, per person, therefore will reward maximum, or, you know, full amount for up to five players, encouraging people to team up together in order to run those sites. Um, so either way, you go, you run the sites, you gain LP. You then come here and you can buy things. You can buy navy uh, navy cap boosters. You can buy data cores. You can buy implants. Like for instance, I never, I never worry about three percent implants, guys. Like to me, a three percent fitting implant is a blank clone. Why? Because I buy them for, uh, let's see, six oh three. Uh, the. CPU is 10,000 LP and 10 million ISK for for the CPU efficiency 3%. Uh, likewise, the you know the power grid and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, fitting implants and other implants very very nice to get here. Um, data cores will often sell, but they go up and down depending on things. Uh, in addition to that, we have naval equipment. So we have navy. Uh, items like uh, plates for the Galente and Navy ammunition. Ammunition is another one of those good sellers, right? If you want to keep a good eye on everything, you're actually going to want to go to the Fuzzworks LP store. Fuzzworks has an LP calculator. 
you can just go here and look up whichever one you want. So I can go to the Federal Defense Union in this case, and I can, you want to check blueprints and we'll show why. And then go to sell prices. And then we can see, okay, well, uh, oh, shoot, I wasn't showing it. Let me go back. So here's the Fuzzworks LP, uh, here's the Fuzzworks pa page. You go to LP store, you select your corp of choice. In this case, I want Federal Defense Union and I do want blueprints and I hit sell. Here we go. So uh, your instinct would be to hit the ISK per LP and find the biggest one, right? Ugh, hold on. So your instinct is to find the biggest ISK per LP, right? So here, oh my God, holy shit, 19,000 ISK per LP? Sign me up. Oh, wait. The problem with this is, is that it's got a 1%, 1, 5% 1, volume. I don't actually know exactly what the 5% uh, defines as. If somebody wants to give a definition in chat, that'd be great. But the way I look at this is how much actually is being bought and sold of this shit, right? How many of them are on the market? What is the 5% of the volume that's on the market? Why they choose 5%, that's the part I don't know. But what this is really suggesting is, sure, you can get 19,000 ISK per LP by spending 1 million, uh, sorry, 2,000 2, uh, LP and 1 million ISK to, uh, plus a this item, which costs less than 5 million. So for 6 million ISK, and two LP, you can get this item that's worth 43, almost 44 million S uh, 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 ISK. That's ridiculous. But the issue is, is that like, the real question is how many people are buying low grade spur deltas, right? How many people are buying uh, low grade spur alphas? Now, if you manage to collect, you know, build all a whole set and sell them on the market, sell them as a contract, then maybe they'll sell. But the issue is, is that this is so this is worth so much because they don't sell very much. So just because you see a really good ISP per LP doesn't mean you want to just cash in all of your fucking LP on it. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you're getting LP in any amount at all, you're not going to want to cash out on any one thing. OK, if you want to maximize your value. Uh, all right. Next. Wait, what? That info is very unclear, the standings part. Uh, Bufu, if you have a question for clarification, I'd love to, uh, I'll, I'll dig into it for you. So we're going to actually look for something with a pretty decent uh, like number. Now, this, obviously, 15,000, holy shit, 15,000, 5% at 7K is per LP. That's amazing. But, but, let's remember... That 5,000 charges is one set. So 5,000 charges is 1,600 LP. So if you run one of the smallest plexes in, uh, in a front line, then you will already have almost enough for 10 sets of this. 50,000 rounds of ammunition when only 15,000 of it is at the 5%. So this is good. You can sell them, but it's not going to be, you're not, this isn't a very efficient way of cap, cashing out massive amounts of LP. I do this based on the volume being sold. I funded most of my faction warfare activities, selling hurricane fleet issues and stabber fleet issues and heck. Exactly, yeah. So optimally, you're gonna to wanna to use this to get your first impression as to what you want to do, but then go to the markets yourself and look at what markets are selling what and how fast they are selling. Now then, now we're getting into the good stuff. Now we're getting into the juicy stuff, right? Moros Navy issue blueprint, 1 million LP, 6,000 is per LP. I don't think this is right. I think that there's other problems here when it comes to the cost of these pieces that may not be estimated correctly. But we're already starting to see that right now, the big winners are the blueprints. 
And this is why we, we showed blueprints in it. Let's explain why this is. So for all of scarcity, <laughs> basically, one of the very first things that they did in scarcity was bottleneck specifically capital production and faction production, uh, faction and pirates, right? And the way that they did it was the introduction of uh, the exploration and faction doodads, okay? Um, going back here for a second, we have... For those of you who don't know, this is Reinforced Carbon Fiber. Reinforced Carbon Fiber is the new Tritanium of EVE Online, okay? Now, for those of you who don't know, with all of the, the, the high-sec moon mining and new reactions and people complaining about the new industrial changes that came out about a year ago, this is it. This is like the crux of it right here. So, the way it works is this. We have these different materials, carbon fiber, oxy, uh, oxy uh, organic solvents, and thermo setting polymers, plus a couple of others. All of these take the same four materials. We have hydrocarbons, ev uh, evaporate materials. Um, we have carbon fiber and, sorry. Yeah, carbon fiber and uh, oxy organic thermo settling polymer. I think I've got them all. Maybe there's one that I missed, whatever, either way. This isn't an industrial training. All of those lead into uh, fact, uh, carbon fiber. And carbon fiber goes into all capital parts, or not all capital parts, but a ton of capital parts, plus auto integrity preservation seals and life support backup units. These two things go into every faction ship in the game, including Triglavian ships. Now, pirate ships require something extra, right? They made it so that pirate faction ships, like this Vindicator here, not only do they take the uh, life support backup units and the auto integrity uh, preservation seals and the core temperature regulators, which also requires reinforced carbon fibers and pressurized oxidizers, which are also just kind of, they're basically like reinforced carbon fibers. They have the same inputs, more or less. So they take all of that, R, this is the R4 reactionables, but you also see these trigger units. These trigger links take uh, these neural link stabilizers. Neural link stabilizers take, oh look, carbon fibers, oxidizers, and these gases. The gases are from, and, and these exploration doodads. These exploration doodads are gotten only in high sec and low sec data sites. This is why you still hear it today. People saying that relic sites are better than data sites. This is only true in null security and wormhole space. In high sec and low sec, data sites are better than relic sites because these things exist. You are specifically looking for info shards, which are one of the lowest tier data site cans and they have a chance of dropping several of these. You can get up to six of these in a single uh, can. And these things are worth quite a bit of money. I've gotten 30 million isk in a single can in low sec because of these fucking things, okay? So these things are very expensive. These right here are why, this is why pirate ships exploded in price, okay? And they were required for all faction ships, right? So uh, the Vexor Navy issue, the Execra Navy issue, all these ships required these things in order to make on top of the R4 reactionables. However, you can actually get these things a second way, right? So let's say I need a Vexor Navy issue. I can get a Vexor Navy issue by getting a blueprint, and then I can run that blueprint and get a Vexor Navy issue. Or I can actually bring a Vexor with a special chip and transform it into a Vexor Navy issue. During the entirety of scarcity, this was the way that faction ships were made. This is why pirate ships exploded in value 
whereas Navy ships did not nearly nearly as much. But it made it so that pumping out these Navy ships was the way that we cashed out our LP. But when the uprising expansion happened, two things happened. One, the LP cost for the blueprints was cut significantly. And secondly, these doodads, the actual exploration doodads that were required for faction equipment was removed from faction equipment. Okay, so now the only special thing that these faction ships require are the life support backup units and the auto integrity preservation seals, both of which can be produced solely from R4 reactionables, which are received from any high sec or wormhole moon. Plus also other moons also provide, you know, like even R64 moons will still have like some R4 in it, more or less, uh, I'm pretty sure. So uh, this has some basic PI requirements and some R4 requirements, but this is just a matter of like how fast you can crank it out, right? So all of this is to say that it suddenly went from transforming ships into Navy ships as being the way to do it to suddenly being now we build these ships. So when you're looking for what is a good is per LP reward, what is often true is these right here, the blueprints. Okay. If we go back to Fuzzworks, we'll see. Federation Navy, uh, Moros is good. Um, Federation Navy Plasma. Okay, those are items. Dominic's Navy is almost 2K is per LP. Uh, Imicus Navy is 2K is per LP. Federation Navy Comet is 1800 is per LP. Imicus Navy Issue is 18 is per LP. 1800 is per LP. Megathron Navy Issue is 1700 is per LP. Federation Navy Comet is 1700 is per LP. Now, I personally believe that all of these numbers are still pretty high right now, simply because Faction Warfare has been so popular. Therefore, the LP has been flowing so heavily that causes a devaluation of the LP. I've seen most people offering somewhere between 1,100 to 1,200 ace per LP for most things involving Faction Warfare stuff now. Um, but uh, yeah, suffice it to say, blueprints are good, or sorry, uh, while implants, ammo, and that sort of stuff is really good to sell for Faction Warfare, these blueprints and the manufacturing of the ships they're in has become one of the best methods for getting LP, uh, or sorry, cashing out your LP. An even better example would be probably if we head on over to the Kaldari, which would be State Protectorate. This is also sell prices, so be aware that buy prices will obviously be very different. But here we got... Um, Because the Kaldari have been so overwhelmed by people farming, you can t see the difference in their LP value. So Heron navies are actually not great. Hook builds are not great. But here we go. Uh, wait, hold on. Time out. Oh, 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 this is turning in the tag. That's right. There's another way to buy the blueprint, which is to get the tag. Right. So if you get the tag, that's not great. But if you get it with just um, with just the LP and ISK, you can see that, you know, the Heron Navy issues 1500 ISK per LP. The hook bill is 1600 ISK per LP. Uh, Caracal's 1300 ISK per LP. Osprey's 1600 ISK per LP. So you can see that their numbers are lower than the Glente, but they're still they're still hanging in there, you know. This is probably one of the best ways to look at uh, getting your LP out. Now, obviously, if you want to fly these ships, this is one of the best ways of getting them. Uh, the thing is also for people who don't use alts, a lot of p uh, prices uh, base people price their base bleh, base their prices off of Jita. I find it. 
a lot of people who just start the game don't want to make alts to pursue Jita, uh, Jita prices. That is fair. Although I would say that you can also go to evemarketer.com. I keep on trying to put this in the emoji spot. You can go to evemarketer.com and check out all of the different places. So I can go Imicus Navy issue. No? Maybe I can't spell. Here's a Vexor Navy issue. So I can tell that like in the Forge, so in Jita we have it for 54k. In Amar we have it for 57k. In Dodixie we have it for 62k. Jeez, we should probably supply that. Um, and if we go down to heck and rens, we, we find all the way 69 K or 69 million. Sorry, not, not K million. Uh, nice, by the way. Nice. Um, heck is keeping it classy with the 69 million. Rens being 71 million. So the difference is, is that like you could sell it in Jita for 54 or you can sell it in Jita or in, in heck for 69. Nice. So. You know, that's worth noting. Although the question then becomes how many people go to Heck or Rens to pick up a Vex or Navy issue. So a good balancing point might be Dodixie. You could sell them in Dodixie for 63 uh, probably pretty easily, honestly. Nobody goes to Rens? Yeah. Uh... I like to make the joke that it's like, well, there's five trade hubs. You know, there's the for Jita, there's Jita for the Caldari, there's Amar for Amar, there's Dodixie for uh, Galente, and there's Heck and Rens for Mimitar because Mimitar can't decide which one they want as their trade hub, so they've just decided to have two that suck. Either way, so cool. So there's plenty of money to be had. There's cool territorial warfare to go over. But Ash, how the hell do I do it? All right, let's get into the meat, meat, meat of this, shall we? Uh, Eve, especially older players doing industry to, uh, to try to pursue the best price. But if you live in heck and rents to sell closer and rents people buy, sell, they're a good beat. But exactly correct, right? Like, what the, the key is if you build near there, then it's local to you and you can sell. And the people that are there will pay a premium. Uh, it's also very true, and, and I say this every single time, if you just go and stock Paragon stations with T1 frigates and destroyers uh, and mining barges, if you want, put them in the Paragon station for 20 to 30 percent more than this trade hub is saying it for, and they will sell. Absolutely will sell. I promise you. I'll be the one buying them if nobody else does. All right. Volume is very important. Market graph is very important. That's absolutely true. And Mar Eve Marketer does that. But my version of, like, for some reason, my computer's been having some weird issues. So, like, I don't know if that will work for me right now. So I'm just not even going to show it. That being said, uh, volume can be deceptive, right? Volume just says how much is being bought, not why things are being bought or not bought. So there's a lot of cases where if people can't go to the store and buy the stuff they need, if they can't buy the full fit that they want there, then they're going to go somewhere else. But if you start supplying it regularly on the market, then people will start buying it, right? Like, if you build it, they will come. All right. So, let's talk about Warzone control and sites. There are three different things to pay attention to when it comes to the site technically four there is which side the site is on the size of the site the type of the site and the quantity of players that are allowed within the site let me put let me change this real quick capture cursor I always keep turning on and off the capture cursor based on whether or not I'm recording or not because I don't want to get my cat cursor when I'm like recording just um That's a good shout, Ash. Which one? 
Oh, the members. Uh, yeah, that's true. Eve Marketer has been. I, I didn't know that they weren't getting updated. I also use Eve Praisal a lot, and J Eve Assets is number one, right? In fact, I'm actually going to go on a little bit of a tangent again and go um, Eve. If you go to our Notion. So here's the notion. If you go to the Convocation of Empyrean side of the notion, which should be adaron.org slash COE, I think. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Uh, if you go here and then go down to Tools and Resources, which I'll link below, uh, you, we have Magic 14. We have Essential Third-Party Tools, Infographics, Websites, and Discord Servers. If you go to Essential Third-Party Tools, we see uh, Pypha, Jave Assets. Um, not sure, don't remember which one this. Oh yeah, Evemon, and uh, Pypha, or not Pypha, um, Peld, which is the damage meter. In fact, I need to turn that on. Hold on. Okay. Um, so what I strongly recommend is Jave Assets. You go to the page it looks a little bit sketchy but trust me it's because people that build eva apps are not necessarily ui engineers um but jave assets is incredibly valuable when it comes to keeping track of where your stuff is it lets you find stuff no matter what account they're on it lets you find stuff that is in a cargo hold it lets you find stuff that's in asset safety and it also cre creates a really cool history of uh of your assets and your wealth to, for, for tracking purposes. Either way, cool. As I was saying, different kinds of sites. <laughs> uh, so right now we are in a system that is owned by the Galente, all right? Therefore, all of the sites are Galente sites, which means if I do these sites, the rat will be Galente, and since I'm Galente, that means I am defensive plexing this system, which means A, I don't need to kill the rat that's inside of it, so I can run any size plex no matter what, but B, I will receive a lower amount of rewards based on the contested value of the system. So for instance, this system right now is at 0.9% contested. So if I completed the site, I would get like three LP, and that's it, right? So the higher the contested system, the contested value of the system, the more defensive plexing will be worth. Offensive plexing, i.e. doing sites inside of an enemy controlled system, will always be worth full value. All right? So that's the first word. The second word, we have scout, small, medium, large, and open. Okay? Scout means frigates only. Okay? Small means destroyers only. Medium means cruisers only. Sorry. Yes. And large means battleships and below, right? So uh, there's no battle cruiser uh, down and down site. Um, so you can get destroyers and frigates into a small. You can get all the way up to cruisers and a medium, et cetera, et cetera. Open has no acceleration gates, which we'll look into that later which means anybody can get into them. There is no restrictions inside of an open. However, the entirety of these sites, all of it, in the inside and the outside, are dead space, which means there's no warping within the site and notably no sinusoidal fields within the sites, even the open one. So if you wanted to, you could bring a capital into an open, but you'd have to sino it somewhere else in the system and then warp it to the site, for example, okay? Now, next, there is NVY or ADV. NVY stands for Navy, and ADV stands for Advanced. Navy means that only T1 and Navy faction ships are allowed in. This means no T2. This means no pirates. This means no uh, SOCT. This means no Triglavians. This means no Eden Calm. Nothing. Just Federation Navy, uh, you know, Caldari Navy, uh, Fleet Issue, or Imperial Navy, 
That's it. As well, and then there's the standard T1. What's important to note here is it does not matter what size the ship in relationship to the actual Plex for whether or not it gets in. In other words, this large Navy will only allow faction or Navy faction and T1 battleships and below inside of this Plex. A curse cannot get in this Plex. It doesn't matter. Now, in an advanced site, T2 are allowed within it. However, T3 is still considered one size bigger. So a T3 cruiser would require a large complex, whereas a T3 destroyer would require a medium complex, but they would still require an advanced. So a T3 destroyer would require a medium advanced as the l smallest type of plex that would allow it in. Uh, and no Navy plexes will let them in whatsoever. Okay? So, in other words, if you really, really, really want to maximize what kind of plexes you can run, you pretty much have to run Navy or T1 ships. Okay? The advanced ships are more for activities outside of the plexes. It's also worth noting that every battlefield, those largest sites with the big fights, those are always Navy. There is no T2. And there's no pirates allowed in any battlefields at this time. So, next. The last piece of information is this number, which right here we see all ones, right? We could also see a five. It can be a one or a five. What a one means is that the reward of the site is distributed evenly among all eligible members within the site, okay? So if I run a scout in a, uh, in a combat or in a command outpost, it's worth 10,000 LP. If I bring five people and complete that site, each one of us gets 2,000 LP. However, if this was a scout Navy five, then uh, and if I ran it by myself, I would get 10,000 LP. Actually, I think I get a little bit more than 10,000 LP because of the fact that it's five, but we're just doing this for the ease of the math. So if I do a, a Navy five by myself, I'll get 10,000 LP. If I do a Navy five with, fi with four other people, each one of us will get 10,000 LP. And if there's 10 of us in the site, then each of us will get 5,000 LP. Because if you have more than the five, then the maximum amount is now distributed evenly among all of the people. Does that make sense? So uh, you now no longer need to worry about stealing the LP from somebody else, assuming it's a five man. But there is still a little bit of tension when it comes to these uh, the one man, okay? So that is the the basics of the sites and how they work as far as like on a broad view. So now let's look at the sites from the inside. We're going to start with the defensive plex. I'm going to go to this small Navy one. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is that I don't warp to the site at zero. You never want to warp to a plex at zero. You always want to warp at some sort of range. It can be 100, it can be 50, it can be 20. You never, ever, 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 ever want to warp at zero. The closest you want to warp is at 10, okay? I'm going to choose 70, and you warp to the site. Now, one thing to note, actually, before I even do. So this is the site that I just went to. You can tell because it's got 29 AU, right? But there's only one other, if I look at the different sites in the room, in the system, there's a, this scout, and there's the medium, and there's the large. So here's the small, here's the scout, here's the medium, here's the large. But wait, wait a minute, there's a second medium. But there's only one medium here. There's the medium advanced, but not the medium navy. What gives? Every site begins its life as a site on the probe scanner. It does not appear on the overview until someone initiates a warp to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to warp to this Navy 1, but then I'm going to immediately cancel warp by hitting control space, and we're going to watch over here to see what happens. I'm going to warp to it, and I control, close, I control space, and look, it opened. 
So now it's on the overview. This means that if you're in a system and you can see that there's a site in the probe scanner, but it's not in the overview, you can tell the moment that anyone warps to it because it appears. We call this popping it or opening the Plex. All right. So I have now opened the Navy One uh, medium, which tells everybody that somebody's probably heading that, that way. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go back to that small that I was looking at earlier. So let's go to the Galente Small Navy One. Every Plex besides uh, the one, besides the opens, have three different parts to it. Now, you can check uh, a site from the outside by scanning it at range, just like you can with any other location. However, there's an extra trick in, in Faction Warfare. If you bring your range all the way down to, to basically the minimum, and you have a 360 degrees, now I will see whatever's inside of the Plex regardless. Now, I'm within 1 AU of something else, apparently. Uh, I'm not sure. But on the out... Nope, 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 nope. On the outside of the Plex, you can see that there's a, uh, an acceleration gate. The acceleration gate is what gates off people from being able to come if they don't have the correct uh, the correct type of ship. You can also see, it's a little bit fainter, let me actually turn off my tactical. You can see that there's this ring with lights around the outside. This ring goes around 100 kilometers outside of the acceleration gate, and this indicates the range in which you can activate the acceleration gate. So this is why we warp to it at range, because uh, you can actually activate this acceleration gate up to 100 kilometers from the acceleration gate. So even if you warp at maximum range, you can still activate the acceleration gate as soon as you land. So this makes it so that even if there's somebody who's out here trying to catch you, it, depending on the, the direction that you warp from and the range that you warp from, you can land anywhere within this 200 kilometer uh, diameter circle. Well, technically sphere. And still be able to activate it. Now, in order to activate this gate, you have to be in faction warfare. You have to be either, you know, you know, you have to be in one side or the other. Well, one of the four sides of faction warfare to activate this uh, acceleration gate freely. If you are not in faction warfare, you can still activate this acceleration gate. However, it gives you a suspect flag, which means in order to activate this gate, you have to go here and turn your safety to partial safety in order to even activate the acceleration gate. It also means that once you've activated this acceleration gate, anybody can attack you freely without any repercussion for 15 minutes. The, you do not get this if you're in the militia because you belong in these sites. The reason why this is important is once again, intel is important, right? So I can use my D-scan to see what's on the outside of a Plex, right? I can see when somebody lands on, side, on, on the outside of a Plex and if they're a pirate, I can even see when they activate the Plex because they're, they will go suspect in local. So this is a lot of intel that get, this gives me as a person that's inside of the Plex. Call it Defender's Advantage, right? So I'm going to activate the Plex and go inside. Inside the Plex, there are two other features that are worth noting. First, we have the beacon. The beacon is right here. And everybody who comes into the Plex will always land within about 2,000 kilometers, or sorry, two kilometers of the beacon, okay? No matter what. You can't control it. You can't come in any other way. Which means, as, an ins as a person on the inside, I can, I can be confident that anybody who comes in is going to be right here. So if I'm a brawling ship, I can be right here on top of it. And, and they have to land on top of me. Now, they could be fast and try to get away from me, but at least we start next to each other. Likewise, if I'm a kiter, I can kick out quite a ways and make sure that they start at a range from me so that way I can, uh, you know, I, I control the, the course of the battle as a, as a person from the inside. So you want to position yourself in relationship to the beacon to maximize your combat potential if somebody was to come in. Uh. 10 kilometers from the beacon is this structure here, 
which we refer to as the button. The button... You must be 30 kilometers from the button in order to count. You can see that there's a ring around the site in the same way that there was in... Uh-oh. You can see that there's a, there's a ring around the site in the same way as there was on the outside. But rather than indicate where the acceleration can get, gate can be used, this indicates how close you have to be to the button in order to count. Now, you can see that the, the timer is already started. And that's because I'm defensive plexing. This rat here is my friend. This is my butler. I'd like, to, I'd like you to meet him. I call him Jeeves. He's a cool dude. I really get sad when people kill my butler. So as a defensive plexer, I don't get nearly as much reward, but I, do, uh, I don't have to kill the main rat, which means um, I could be doing larger sites. I don't have to do this small complex. I could do as large of a complex as I want to because I don't have to break the rat. These rats, they don't do very much damage. They have very low DPS, but they have pretty decent tanks. These are designed to be DPS checks. So more likely than not, it's not that the rat is going to kill you. It's going to be that you can't necessarily break the rat fast enough. And the timer does not tick down when there's an enemy within the area. So if we were in a Caldari site right now, oh, they left. Uh, if we were in a Caldari site right now, I would have to kill this rat. And as long as this rat was alive, the timer would be stopped as contested. So what is really true is that this site is a 10 minute timer plus whatever time it takes to kill the rat. This is why, like, if you barely can break a high-level rat, it may not be worth running the site because it takes so much more time to kill the bad guy. You might want to bring a ship with more DPS or maybe even more ships to be able to break the rat quickly in order to get the site done quickly. Other than that, we are simply sitting here and basically playing King of the Hill. I sit here for 10 minutes and... If anybody shows up, I have to make a choice of whether or not I'm going to defend the site or I'm going to leave. Now, obviously, I can watch my directional scan so I know if anybody's on, uh, on the gate. Uh, you know, this is a Navy Plex, so I know for a fact that nothing spooky like a curse can get in here, even if it was a medium or a large. So that's not the problem. Um, but if I see things showing up on the D scan, I can make a decision. I can, I can decide to align out, right? Like I could, I, could, I could align out to here and slowly chug around because I can, I've got 30 kilometers, right? So I can be slowly moving and aligned and be fine. I can even pick another one on the other side. And when I get too close to this side, I can realign in the other direction. And now I'm just kind of pacing back and forth, constantly ready to leave. So that way, if somebody does decide to slide in and I don't want to fight them, I can just get out before they manage to get me. Um, likewise, I can just watch to see whether or not it's a fight that I want to take. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, I can do things like watch local to see whether or not uh, a pirate is the one activating the gate. Obviously, a pirate is going to be less inclined to harass you, uh, whereas a, a, an enemy militiaman may stay and continue to bother you. If, if you see a bunch of pirates get on your ga gate and you warp off before right as they come in, chances are they'll move on. But if you do it to a state, or like a, not a state, but an enemy faction member, then there's a pretty decent chance that they'll cut, they'll stay and start running it themselves or, you know, whatever. So you have to make your choice as to whether or not it's worth it to you to stay and fight. You can make it all the way down to five seconds. And if you get pushed off, you get nothing for all of your time. Likewise, you can, um, you have to unwind any time that's done by anybody else, right? So if I got pushed off right now, the Caldari guy that comes before me will have to run this site for five minutes and, f uh, and 40 seconds or 20 seconds, right? Yeah, whatever. They have to undo the amount of time that I've wound up and also do their own time, right? So actually, we're not going to finish this site today. We're going to push this site a little bit further and then we're just going to leave because finishing the site won't do anything really for us. Our, our system is less than 1% contested. But by running up this plex and not finishing it, now the state has to run the entire timer, twice the timer, in order to get this silly little site done. Okay? Yeah. The other thing that's important to note is that this fight, or this, uh, this whole mechanic, is not happening in a vacuum. Okay? As we can see, 
there's a bunch of different sites within the system right now, all different sizes. And right now, this site, this system isn't highly contested. It's a, it's a rear guard system. It's low priority. Nobody's going to get any LP for finishing the sites here. Nobody's really coming to mess with me. But if you're actually doing war zone control, or if you're actually doing stuff for, for pay in the advance or in the, in the war zones or in the front lines and in the uh, command outposts, the chances of people coming in and disrupting things become much higher. But also the fight is actually happening, not just in one plex, but across all of them, right? You've got a fleet from both sides. You've got people on both sides that are trying to take over the system and they are sending their different people in different sites because, well, the frigates can only go into here and the cruisers can go into here and all these different things. And people are reshipping and the fight kind of ebbs and flows and moves as the site or as the system continues to be contested over the course of sometimes days or even weeks of nonstop plex, uh, plex fighting within that system. So this isn't just, uh, we're teaching the very basics of mechanics, but realize that the complexity comes from how these, how these mechanics all come together when it comes to people uh, engaging with them in the key systems. So, this is pretty much what plexing is all about, and I think that this pretty much covers all of, everything I want to talk about when it comes to plexes. Uh, as I said, it is considered to be kind of a faux pas to come into a plex at the last second and, you know, gain the rewards unless it's a dash five. Um, but, you know, if, if you get, you know, we're all here for a purpose. Don't get too butthurt and don't be a jerk. Make some friends. Chances are people within the sites, if they're purple, are going to be somewhat friendly to you. But always be cautious. Now then, let's go ahead and find where we want to actually go. Well, we are here in Fleet. Uh, so the next closest one, let's go ahead and check out Devon. Let's see if Devon, well, there's Devon and Aboon. Devon's at 16% contested, Aboon is at 20% contested, and Oin is at 77% contested, and Nag is at 66% contested. So chances are, just based on what we looked at, we could pretty much assess that Aldrinette is going to be a higher... Uh, Aldrinette and Oix are definitely the hotter sites, uh, but that's the other side of the war zone right now. So we're going to actually poke at... Um, I'd really like a. I'd really like to go to Natoras. Natora. Natora. Matoras. Notoras. Because it's a Kaldari um, uh, command outpost. Or Nisoa or Pine for being um, front lines. I could do defensive... Actually, a defensive plexing in Oin could be good, too, because that high contested value means that I'm still going to get quite a bit of LP. So let's go ahead and head to Oin. I want to get out of here before the before the site actually finishes. So I left with 10 seconds on that, on that timer. So assuming nobody in the Galente comes in and finishes it off, that means the Caldari will have to run that timer for 19 minutes and 50 seconds in order to complete it. So that is what they call in the in the uh, faction warfare universe a dick move. Okay. So, I'm in Oin. It's a frontline system and it's highly contested. So, I want to run a site here. There are sites that are already open. There's a large there's the supply depot. Uh, there's a medium. There's the small. And there is a small that is also still closed, but I, um, and it's a five, but it's also an advanced. And I don't really want to do it in advanced. So none of these sites are within D scan range of me. So I'm going to see about warping to one of my bookmarks to see if I can get closer. So in the same way that I can go with a minimum range 360 degree D scan, I can go for a maximum range 5 degree D scan, hold the D scan key, and click on the site, 
to see if there's anything inside. And the answer is, there's a Thrasher fleet issue inside. I personally do not know whether or not that Thrasher fleet issue is friendly or not. There is one hostile within system. There's, oh, yeah, there's two Galente supply depots. There's the Glente small. There's the Glente medium. So I'm actually going to run the Glente large. Because if the thing... Oh, no, hold on. The, the enemy is out of the system. So that means that Thrasher fleet issue is not an enemy. It's one of these allies, okay? So I'm not going to go in there because that's that'd be barging in on him and that'd be kind of a, a, a jerk move. So I'm going to warp to this large outpost at range. And now I switch it to 360 degrees. Minimum range. There's nothing inside. So I head inside. So the way things work when it comes to descanning, since it was brought up, oh, I got to keep an eye out for it. Um, so the the way that descan works, you can see here. Sorry, one thing at a time. I'm in a larger plex now, right? So the rat's bigger. It's a battle cruiser instead of a uh, destroyer, and uh, you can see that this timer actually already started. There was a fight here. There's a couple of, uh, actually, there's a couple of rats that got killed, but then whoever was in here left. They only got it pushed up by about two minutes or a minute and a half or so. So my 15 minute timer has become a 16 minute timer. I have to undo the minute of damage that the opponents did. Um, but yeah, local. Okay. So local starting to fill up. We can tell that this is snuff. Now snuff likes to do big things. So chances of them like storming into my plex is pretty low, but I'm actually going to build up my uh, my thing big, so that way I can see anybody who's in system with me, right? Especially since these supply depots exist, so I'm going to bring it down to five degrees, so that way I can see exactly where I'm pointing at. And then switch back to 360 degrees. It's starting to get nervous, so I'm going to poke it uh, one degree to see if there's anybody getting close. There's not, so I go back up to max degree. So I'm trying to see who all's coming, if there is anybody, right? I'm trying to get an eye on a beat on the enemy fleet that's passing through. Chances are I might not see him. Oh, there's a scorpion. They're not. They don't seem to be coming here though. And they're despiking already. A little bit. So I'm using my different tools, local and directional scan, uh, in different ways in order to assess where the enemy is. So I can go here to five degrees, see that they're not at the Nisawa gate. So they must be at like the Pine Gate. Or maybe even a boon. And there they go. So. Uh, back to being kind of calm. So now I can show you guys this. If we look on the solar system map, you can see that there's this sphere around me, right? This sphere is my directional scan sphere. If I hit my descan key, which I have smartly rebound to spacebar, like you should, you can see these little pings. And in fact, it actually shows you like, well, it just did it too, whatever. Usually, like, if there's a... Ah, there it is. See? There's things. Things appeared on the D-scan. You can kind of see the image of it. But either way, I'm not worried about that right now. So if I change the size of my D-scan, you can see that the size of the sphere changes. This shows me what is in range of my D-scan. And that's cool. But what's even more cool is this angle thing. So if I change the angle, you can see it go from full circle to half circle, 
to 90 degree cone to 60 degree cone to 30 degree cone to 15 degree cone all the way down to basically a narrow line with a five degree cone now the way to control the cone itself though the center of the cone is actually if you zoom out this box around your ship that appears when you're zoomed out that is the center of your d scan okay so you can see if i look in here as i turn my camera i'm going to also be changing where the d scan is pointing the other key is if i hold the d scan key which in my case is spacebar because i'm smart and i changed it i can now click on a thing on my overview a planet or whatever and it'll snap to that thing and then scan it this is how i check a bunch of places real quick so i can be like oh is there anything at the medium no is there anything at the small there's that thrasher still is there anything at the supply depot no is there anything at the other supply depot no okay great i'm safe right is there anything at the nissel gate no so that is how five degree works and then likewise as I said, if you go to 360 degrees, then you see everything that's within your area. So now I can see everybody within five, 10 AU of me. It doesn't tell me if somebody's coming to me directly, but it does tell me if they're in the system. If I've got multiple people in here, and I've got one person set to 14.3, I've got one person set to 5, and I've got one person set to 0.1, now we, now we have this really cool feature where the first person will call out something. They'll be like, Thrasher on long. And then the guy at five degrees, a few seconds later, calls Thrasher on mid. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me that there's a Thrasher that's in warp towards me. And then when the short calls it out, now I know that they're going to be landing within a few seconds, right? So not only am I knowing what's out there and relatively how far, but I even can tell what direction they're traveling based on how they appear and disappear from our scans. This is really important because like as a faction warfare pilot, as a plexer, I'm probably gonna be in this system for a while. So what I'm gonna be doing is the whole time I'm here is I'm gonna be trying to assess everything that's going on, right? This station, this system has no stations. I mean, it may have some player structures in it. Um, yeah, it has some player structures in it, but it doesn't have any NPC stations. So the question is, who are these guys, right? We've got we got one of these people, probably either White Widow or in Indogizia, whatever. Uh, one of these two is probably that Thrasher fleet issue. If I went into the small, I could probably figure out which one it is. Then there's this pirate who we haven't seen yet. So if he goes suspect at any time, that's that means that he's probably going into one of the different uh, plexes. And I've got Spoons, who's out here keeping an eye out for everybody because he's a hero, right? But I know what's going on. I have, an, I have an awareness of the system. And as I sit here, I'm going to continue to build my awareness of the system and what's going on nearby. So that way, oh, look, this guy just showed up and he's already a suspect. Um, but he is Galmil, so I shouldn't be worried too much about that. Okay? Uh, and that's it. Pretty much this way. This is it. Yes, we're finishing up, or we're just uh, talking about Faction Warfare, and we're uh, wrapping up this plex. We've got a minute and 20 seconds left before this plex is over. Again, we have specifically chosen a site that is of low tension. The chances of somebody coming and harassing us in this site is relatively low, mostly because I wanted to, A, show you that that was possible, and B, uh, I wanted to be able to walk through this kind of as a dry run. So we did a walk through in Fleet, and now we're doing, sorry, we did a crawl through uh, in, in Fleet. Now we're doing a walk through in here in Oin, and then we're going to head on towards the front lines and see whether or not we can, uh, how much more lively it is in a front line system. 23 seconds, sorry, 13 seconds. I don't think anything's coming in here. So seven seconds left. And then we will get a notification here. Boom. So what I get, what I get, what I get. I got extra standings and I got loyalty points. How many loyalty points did I get? So I just got 21,666 loyalty points. So on the one hand, 
I sat around and did nothing for 15 minutes. On the other hand, I got, well, let's see, let's do the calculation. I know I could probably do this in my head, but this is more fun. Oh, hey, speaking of problems, there's the state. So if I go 21666 times 1100, just giving a really low estimate, I just got 23 million ISK worth of LP in 15 minutes. And I, so I saw them at 1 AU, which puts them on this planet or in that iHub, but not in the site. I mean, the chances of them coming here exactly is relatively low. Looks like they went to the medium. Is there anything else in that direction? Nope, they're in the medium. Caldari Navy hook bill, Imicus Navy issue, Federation Navy comment, car, and another hook bill. But that's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's only four of them, so there's still more. There they are. Yep. That's what I was afraid of. They're going to want to kill me, but let's go ahead and get, try to get eyes on there. So again, this supply depot is giving us advantage, right? This thing right here. If they were to shoot and blow this thing up, it would lower our advantage, which would also affect the neighboring system. I believe. But that does not appear to be what they're doing. So there's one in this small. Oh, they're deplexing. I'm going after the small then. Or despiking, rather. So this hook bill is either a friend or I'm about to fight him. Now, had I have identified who these other people were, then I'd be have a better idea, but I didn't. And I'm going to want to keep an eye on my five degree just in case. And it's a war target. Okay. He warped away. So now I'm going to white and watch. See if anybody else comes in here. Now if that whole squad starts piling up, or even if a few of them start coming in, they could just be tackled for the rest of the forces. I'm probably going to take the fight either way, just because I want to show you, you know, we want to have some excitement. But, you know, it's worth keeping in mind that they have a lot of backup. Now, they could have also just gone to a different site, right? Like, they can keep moving sites, and I will have to keep chasing them around, and they'll just be able to build up um, points, so that way... You know, even with us me, me actively trying to stop them, they would still be able to contest sites, even if they, if even if I couldn't or they couldn't fight me directly. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily the case right now. They probably should be able to fight me just fine. But my point is that, like, if it was the other way around, and there was like, uh, and I was trying to disrupt them, there are ways like an individual that really wants to fuck with people can actually get a lot done in disrupting these plexing because again. This is around the clock, right? So as you finish these plexes, it continues to build up. And there are some times that like the state is better or has more power than than uh, than the Federation. You know, the state generally have a better EU. The Federation has a better US in general. Um, so what that means is, is that like if I am playing during the EU, even if all I do is slow down their efforts in a specific system, I don't take any sites at all. I just prevent them from being able to take sites as quickly or at all. 
what I've done is effectively aided my own forces because now when it's when we manage to retake the area with our forces and start plexing, we have less to, to undo, right? Like if we are always able to prevent them from working and then get our own stuff done, then we win over time. Chances are the Amicus Navy is one of the other guys, one of my guys. So if worse comes to worse, I would, so like if I had problems here, what I would do is I would fall back into the medium because I already know that I've got a friend over there. So assuming that we start getting harassed, I would fold down into him and then we would potentially try to like hold it together, you know? But as long as we're not being actively harassed, being split up is actually better. You know, sovereignty. But the thing is, is that like, oh, here we go. Oof. That's a lot of damage. Ah! Oh! Nope. That is a lot of damage. I was really hoping that my newts would finish off his uh, cap before then. But nope, I should have overheated my net rack of newts. And it's just that simple. Now we go reship. Uh, no, it's a whole tank ship. So, I mean, technically I could have started repping sooner, but had I have not taken an extreme blast of damage right then, then I would have overrepped and that would have been worse. Those navies, man, it is, it, they're hard to beat. Especially since, like I said, I, I don't, I, I, that fit sacrifices three of its guns for newts. So I was really hoping that the newts would kick in. Yes, he does get kill, uh, LP for killing me. Not a whole bunch. Oh yeah, absolutely. Be ready to lose some fights, man. Like that's the whole point. I guess the whole point is to win fights, but you, you get what I'm saying. But, you know, people people talk about, you know, oh, I don't like sitting in plexes or whatever, but like, you want lots of good fights? That plex fighting, man. It's better, it's certainly better than gate camping or roaming. I think that that was a pretty complete view of faction warfare right we managed to uh almost finish you know we we pushed up a plex we finished a plex and then we got a fight in a plex all within 20 to 30 minutes so there's stuff going on here there's guys on both sides but i actually have no idea where anybody is right now i don't know which ones of these are bad i don't know which ones of these are good but there's a battlefield so let's go see if we can survive in a battlefield for more than three seconds shall we I don't know what's happening in this battlefield. Might be good, might be bad. Let's go find out. I don't care. My ship's cheap. That's the thing. Fly around in cheap ships. Then the question of, what should I do? Is, fuck it, just do whatever you want, man. If it's a bad idea, then you're dead. Whatever. Do it again. Only one way to find out. If I look on the inside... I can see that all that's in there right now is an extra Navy issue and a Cormorant Navy issue. So we're going to go. Oops. No, no, no. There we go. I keep trying to radial off of the structures instead of the acceleration gate. That's going to be some. That's going to be a habit I'm going to have to get rid of. Yes, you never warp to zero to gate. Okay, so the Execra Navy issue is. Oh, boy, they're both Kaldari. So I'm going to go this way. <laughs> I'm going to go the way that they aren't. 
looks like they're trying to deal with the rats over there. I'm going to go deal with the ones over here. As you can see, the battlefield is huge. So these guys over here are 200 kilometers away. These ones over here, 100 kilometers away. So it's like four to 500 kilometer wide battlefield right here. All kinds of things to look at, too. I will admit that one of the reasons why I'm kind of laissez-faire about everything is because of the fact that I know that if I'm doing anything serious, that's when the stream snipers and everything can show up, so might as well just not care, right? That executor of Navy issue's cooking it here. Look at him. He's burning over here so fast. He wants me so bad. Kill him. Just kill the destroyer, man. That's all I want. That's all I want for Christmas. 70. All right, I got to pull in. All right, well, there you go. So, Faf, this guy right here is in here in an Atron. This is why you rename your ships, guys. I can tell that this guy is this guy in here. You don't want to give away any extra intel. Although, in this case, it's kind of useful to me. Because now I know that the guy on the inside is my friend. Oh, but it's captured. <laughs> What is he doing in here then? What what is he doing in here? What what's going on? The oh he just left. He literally just left. All right, well. I'm going to go to the Navy 5 because hopefully I'll be able to rendezvous with people. Unless you name your ship something else in local? Yeah, well. No, you can't warp around in them. They're dead space. The data sites are, are, are really touch and go. Executor, two Executor Navy issues. We're just going to hope. We're just going to hope that I'm not super unlucky, okay? We're just going to hope that we're not super, super, super unlucky. Because there's already two squids uh, accounted for. Fuck! Wasn't lucky. Failed to be lucky. What the hell even just happened? What what just happened? What? Why didn't Executor just run from me? He had the Executor Navy issue there. If he had just grabbed me, they would have killed me. Well done. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the standings loss, etc., since we cover most of it at this point? So the standings loss is actually not that high. Uh, a lot of people give the standings loss a little bit too much credit. There's only two real sources of the standings loss. One, if you do the missions, if you do faction warfare missions, which you don't need to do, and I don't recommend them, uh, that will give you standings as you gain standings, or you, know, you go after their, their fleet. The only other real source of standings issues is, um, is when you get promoted. And even that is just derived standings. Basically, at that point, when you when you get promoted, you get such a big bonus to your own personal faction standings that it does cause a small hit to the enemy faction standings. But assuming that you're not constantly running missions or whatever means that you should be just fine. Uh, I was in Faction Warfare for six years or something like that. And uh, we can go and see 
that while the state aren't huge fans of me, we're at negative 145. And they're all derived, right? So this only happens for when I uh, gain bigger standings with the Galente. So it's the same as if you did like storyline missions in order to get faction standings. Potting seems to give standings too. Uh, that, okay, so if you attack an enemy militia member that is part of the militia corp, you'll gain, you'll get a hit from that corp, but that doesn't derive. So like I'll, I lose standings with state protectorate. But that doesn't make me lose standings with the Kaldari. All right, battlefield. Ferox Navy issue and a bunch of Atrons, with one of the Atrons being one of the allies. So let's go. Pretty sure that Ferox Navy issue is going to be a problem, but whatever. I can't just leave three Atrons in there to do it. Especially when two of them are default named. There's a slasher. Oh, the Ferox Navy issue's on the outside, huh? Clever. All right. We're going to haul ass to that middle one. So you're going to see, like, we've been playing this game for, like, we've been out here for, like, 40 minutes, and all kinds of different things have all happened. This is pretty normal. Why... Well, they're clearly shooting at something that I can't see. Oh. Oh, there they are. What just landed? Punisher. All right, so now that the rat's dead, this timer is now ours to start ticking. More rats can spawn, and that Punisher could come over here. But barring that, we are working on this timer. There's the Ferox. There's another rat in here.
Uf. That Ferox Navy's coming for me too. Why aren't the battleships showing up on my thing, I wonder? They need to be 66 before I can lock them. Hey, thanks for the sub. Defanging me. Okay, now if I can just get this battle cruiser dead. Boom. Now then, I wish that, that the colors were a little bit more distinct. The gray to the green, it's hard to tell that the ring is actually filling up. There's another battleship and some other garbage.
it would be cool if like some bigger ships showed up as like support and killing those were extra worth extra points. That Ferox Navy issue is just an opportunist. Opportunist. That's all. That is it. Ugh, I want to be within 12. There's the Ferox Navy. Going in, going in, going in. Fuck, he's faster than me, too. I'm gonna need a tackle on him if I'm gonna want to get him. Shit, I am in so much trouble. Yep, I'm in trouble. Shit. Okay. What just happened? Oh, he killed somebody else. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I just didn't have it. I didn't have it by myself. Uh, any issue, on, any questions on the seagulling issue? Uh, I mean, I think that it's going to resolve itself. I think that they overreacted to it.
Well, I mean... Accomplish the objective. That's what matters, right? I'm going to have to get more drones after this, though. Yeah, um, GM Trails is our uh, supply officer, executive officer, whatever you want to call it. So she's a very good person to be asking questions of. You may as well consider her answers my answers. Oh, I just realized that the uh, the Vexor Navy issue doesn't have the uh, drone speed bonus of the battlecruiser or destroyer. But that rep bonus certainly did serve me well today. Oh, I'm at a totally different spot than I was before. Holy crap, because I was in the center. It's pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> no, we got a lot of support for the war effort. I mean, like, ships need to be brought in, ships need to be built. There's hauling, there's mining, there's low-sec mining. There's all kinds of different stuff. The problem is that it's much harder for me to give you, like, 100% solid answers because it's pretty opportunistic and also mildly OPSEC. That, that Ferox was fast, wasn't it? That was really fast. I think he was using skirm boost, but that that was really fast. Can we get a narration of Templar One? The uh, the on Audible. There's a there's a great version of Templar One on Audible. I'm certainly not going to do my own version of it when they sell one for money. The other thing you can look into is, uh, I mean, just look at the kill boards of the different, like, groups. Like, if you just looked at Aderon's kill boards and then you just started stocking that stuff in Fleet, people would buy it. It's very simple. I think that was a pretty fun little skirmish with the Ferox, though. <clears throat> For some reason, the Galmil fights, uh, sites and battlefields are hostile in Minmil. I think that that's true. I think battlefields are just mostly built for the actual faction that's supposed to be in them. 
So this is actually an interesting technique. If you notice, we've actually dragged the rats outside of the hole, the circle. So we're actually running the timer, even though there are technically rats still in existence. So that is one of the strategies is just pull the rats out, but that's easier said than done because the rats can actually spawn onto the, or aggro onto the defense, the NPCs. So it's hard to guarantee that they'll stay outside. Uh, for those of you who want a status report on the battlefield itself, I think, there you go. You can see it's, a uh, we're at 62% right now. Oh, God, and my Peld wasn't even working that whole time. Gosh darn it. Oh, and I don't have any more long-range ammo. Uh, let's hope they don't notice. More rats. Can I hit him? Can I hit him? No, he's out of range. View. We are at 67%. Ah. <sighs> Just starting a new tune and putting them into Amar Militia. I realized the SOE Epic Arc starts in Glente space. Yeah, well, the, the SOE Epic Arc goes to all four areas, so you really can't do the SOE Epic Arc while in Faction Warfare. That's true. I ran into that problem as well. 69%. Nice. And uh, if you notice that the local seems like exactly the opposite of what it was when we first started this, so...
Trying to lead the, uh, the destroyer to get close to him. Yeah! There we go. There's some clean shots. Boom! I want to stay close. Boom. Keep it up, guys. Keep it up. We got this. 73%. Yeah, if you want to sell your propaganda towers, you can uh, talk to the people in Galmil. Uh, honestly, if you're in the Galmil, you should be in the Galmil Discord. It's where all of the coordination is happening and where you can find a group. I'm having fun. This is exciting. These rats keep showing up. Look at them all flying in formation and stuff. That's cool. I do wish you got some sort of points or whatever for killing the rats, that's for sure. Again, I like I, I wouldn't even necessarily need LP. I just want victory points. I want the site to finish clean you know, like get more points towards completion of the site. Not necessarily like a ISK or LP or anything like that. I just if I kill a bunch of your cruisers, I should be able to finish the site faster. Seventy-seven percent. Yeah, there's a lot of indie pro uh, uh, options, uh, not least of which cranking out these BPCs that people are getting and turning them into ships. You guys could really stop now.
Come on. Oh, shoot. Got a good shot on the cruiser. And I took my shot. <laughs> Boom. We're getting there. We're getting there. 80%. Uh, you mean the normal PVE sites? What do you mean by normal PVE sites? The, you can, technically, I think you can do the rendezvous points and the supply caches as a neutral. You have to be in Faction Warfare to do the Faction Warfare hacking sites. You love the idea of running around uh, in a giant warship defending a hologram of Celis Agard. That's what I'm talking about. The bull cut butcher is my president. Oh, for crying out loud. All right, we are at 83. Yeah, there's not really a PVE sites in, in Faction Warfare in the same sense that you'd think of probably. Unless you count this as PVE, I suppose. Eighty six percent. I kind of like the fact that battlefields are basically like a little microcosm of the war zone, right? Like you constantly are like building up points for the overall capture. Like you watch the spinner spin over and over again. And every time it finishes, it increases the percentage of, of the victory. The same as what, how it works within a system. Just a little microcosm. I have to put, hit my micro warp drive to keep up with the battleship, apparently. That's different.
get close to one of these guys. Don't need my reps anymore. All right, 89%. 90. 90. <laughs> Let's shoot some fools, yeah. I uh, <laughs> spoons. I love you, brother. Highly unnecessary. <laughs> oh, here comes all of the uh, the seagullers, I'm assuming. That that's what these guys are. At least some of them. I'm not going to even shoot unless they get close to me. I need to cut off these guys. Everything goes so fast.
Come on. There we go. Well then, I'll just let them do that while we run the timer. We are at 95%. Almost there. Ninety six point three. Edge it. <laughs> Ninety-seven point or ninety-eight point three. That looks so cool, though. Like, let's be real. Even if you want to consider these guys seagulls or and want to be grumpy, like it looks so cool. I'm not even gonna fight these dudes, right? Because we just win, don't we? Just win. Ninety nine point seven. This one's gonna win us, right? Just this one. Should probably rep though. This should do it. Boop. Yay! We won the battlefield! All right. Loyalty points. I gained 48,000 loyalty points for that. 48,000. Woo! That's pretty cool. All right, let's go back home, set up our overview, and wrap things up for the day. I think that this was a pretty good show off of, uh, of faction warfare at all kinds of different levels. There you go. Very cool. Well, I think that that's probably about a good enough for today. So, uh, hi, uh, unless there's somebody, you know, if you've got some last minute questions or whatever in chat and that's fine. Uh, let's see, let's do a little bit of administrative work. So this week is the last week before winter break. I don't know what I'm going to be up to during winter break, how much I'm going to be able to stream, how much I'm not going to be able to stream. That's all up in the air. However, I have started posting updates as to the nature of the stream, like when I'm going to be streaming, whether or not I'm going to be streaming. I'm trying to post those more on the YouTube. So if you go to the YouTube community page, that's where I'm going to be posting those kinds of updates from now on, not on Twitter primarily. Uh, in addition, I will put up polls and other stuff that's there for people, both for members and non-members, because I want help knowing, you know, making this channel the best it can possibly be. Uh, in the meantime, the Theodicy videos have been coming out one by one. And let me tell you, so let's be re real talk. Those chronicle readings that I do, not only are they some of the harder ones that I to do, because it's just like hours of reading, which for a dyslexic is great. Um, you did your darndest with the chronicles and sold me on faction warfare today. I will be returning. Excellent. You know, and this is this. Thank you for saying that, because as I was just saying, I put a lot of work into those chronicles and it's hard for me to like, you know, it's a, it's a lot of time. And then we edit them and all that stuff. But I'll let you know. Those things do worse than almost any of the other videos, right? If I make a video that's like telling gankers or telling, you know, people bitching about ganking that they that they suck and they need to get good, like that's going to get a couple thousand views. But like the the chronicles get a few hundred at best. And the issue is is that like of course 
because the chapters are subsequent, each chapter, less people come and watch it. So right now we're coming out with all the different chapters. We put in all the effort to cut out the chapters and all that sort of stuff, but they've got really low views. So just if you want to go back through them and watch them all together uh, or whatever, then that'd be great. Uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, if, you, if you'd be willing to go back and check those out, that'd be awesome. I'm still going to do them. I'm still going to do them. Just realize that like those in 100% lower ones end up not being the strongest of, uh, of performers. So uh, you all can help that out by sharing them around and getting people to check them out. Um, if you are a patron or a member, you already have access to the whole playlist of all of the ones that we have edited. And I think by the end of the day, we should have the rest of them, all seven of them at least, or eight or nine of them all at least like available there. And then they'll be continuing to roll out over the course of the next few days. I'm going to put out number four basically as soon as I go offline. Um, and uh, yeah, and then hopefully we'll be like, we'll make one master one later on to, to release. But uh, yeah, but also, you know, I've been going back through, there's a lot of videos. If you are new to the channel, relatively new, realize that while I do have timely videos, I do have a lot of videos that I've created that are specifically evergreen, especially in the training playlist and places and in the lore playlists. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to check out. Uh, we've, we've done videos where we go over every single module type in the entire game and every fitting consideration. I talk about how to do sharing bookmarks, how to do different D-scan, how to fix your radial menu, everything that you could know to become a better pilot uh, that isn't necessarily taught by other channels. Because here, we are here to help raise literacy of EVE Online, which means not just introducing people to how cool EVE Online is, but also teaching people to understand EVE Online. I'm not here to give you a fit. I'm here to teach you how to fit. I'm not here to tell you exactly how to run a site. I'm here to learn, teach you how to fly better. That's what we're here to do, okay? So the winter event starts in two days. Be ready for it. Uh, I will be there. And tomorrow is Wednesday, so chances are I will not be streaming. So then on Thursday for the for the uh, the new event, I will be here to show it off. But until then, I've been Ash Rothy. I've been playing this game since 2010, talking about it since 2012, and I'm here to put even to context for you, my fellow Empyreans. Thank you guys so much for coming to the stream. Thank you for checking it out on the YouTubes. Uh, I do want to give special thanks to the people that aren't here. Hold on. Uh, I do want to thank all of my supporters, in particular, uh, my co-designers of Abyssus. <laughs> Spoons' wife, who still hasn't taught me how to pronounce her name. Aerodynica the Queen, Black Rose Noble, Dejat Lamont, Dejat Lamont, Drake, Golden Age Stories, J. Coon, Malik, Starfire, Midnight Space Monkey, Not Just Fun, Seeds of Plenty, Sir with No Eyes, Selenia, Siliana Velesh, Nephilim, Grendel, and Zalnex, as well as my Immortal Tier supporters, Evo Elite and Rid. Thank you, guys. Make sure to check out Golden Age Stories, by the way. If you like this sort of content, the Faction Warfare stuff, he does Galente Faction Warfare stuff all the time. So uh, just remember, guys, glorification of the fit, mortification of the unfit. EVE Online is just a series of challenges and puzzles for you to solve. Getting mad doesn't fix anything. So... Until next time, I have been Astrothi, the voice of New Eden, and I'll see you in space.